and welcome to the Virtue Cafe. I'm your host, Shagilola Salami. Um, who have I got here with me today? Leb Sapurski. So I am a professor at Ohio State, research the intersection of psychology and behavioral economics, and I also run a nonprofit that popularizes these to a broad audience, Intentional Insights at intentionalinsights.org. I'm an author. I wrote Find Your Purpose Using Science and a bunch of other books. Okay. okay, sorry. You you said you said that really quickly. I thought I said, so. You I think I heard you say you're a professor at Ohio State University. Research something like that. Yes, so I'm a professor at Ohio State University. I research okay. the intersection of psychology and behavioral economics. Oh. And, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Okay. Cool. And there was yeah. the. Yes, so, and still my little human. She doesn't. Know, she's do not know. excited. I know, right? Because Christmas is almost here, and she's yeah, decided she wants fine. to have ice cream. No ice, ice cream. Ice cream for Christmas? That's cold. I know, right? And then it's like yeah. we have these evil, like in our local parks, right? The ice cream man, he's evil. He just waits till all the children are there, you know, in their coats running around. And then he knocks with his van, and the jingle comes, and all the children just run after him. And I'm like, it's winter. Why is the ice cream man coming out? I know. Why? That's so weird. I remember um, I was doing research in Russia for about nine months, and my wife came over to Russia to Moscow, and uh, she, when we're going by like a store, she actually got ice cream in Moscow in the winter. It was really like a funny moment. That, you know, she just wanted to freak me out a little bit. <laughs> that was really funny. <laughs> no, I'm, no, seriously, because even when I'm walking past supermarkets, right, the freezer is filled with ice cream. I'm like, who has ice cream in the middle of winter? Like, seriously. Yeah, no, it's a weird thing. Apparently, um, so she had a story where uh, when her mom went on her f went on a date with her dad for the first time, uh, it was in the, it was in the winter, and we're both from the former Soviet Union. And it okay. was in Moscow in the winter. So her mom and her dad, and her dad kind of asked her mom in a joking way, like, oh, hey, do you want ice cream on a date? And she was like, oh, you're going to, like, you know, mess with me. Okay, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll get some ice cream in the winter. So she got ice cream in the winter on the first date with, you know, her dad. <laughs> nice. Well, that's a nice icebreaker, something, something unusual. Exactly, exactly. An ice cream icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, I hope you're not going to ask for ice cream because there's no ice cream in this virtual cafe. No worries, no worries. I'll just get some tea. I prefer tea when, you know, some uh, English breakfast tea, actually, if you have some. <laughs> so what, Earl Grey? Yes, Earl Grey would be good. Perfect. How do you like your tea? I like it black. Okay, any sugar? No, nope, no, nope, just plain tea. That's fine. Well, normally I would say to people that a little human, she's going to take her time and she's going to get the drink. But since she turned two, she's like, sorry, I'm not interested in slave labor um, or child <laughs> labor. So she's, you know, we'll just have to wait. And then once we finish chatting, I'll go and get your drinks for you because she's just there in the middle of something. I'm, I'm not even going to get involved at all. But no yes, way. okay, cool. So you said you were an author. Um, what books yes. have you written? What, what's, what's, your, what's your thing? Sure. So the book I'm most well known for is Find Your Purpose Using Science. So it takes the research on finding meaning and purpose from the behavioral economics, psychology, cognitive neuroscience, mm -hmm. medicine, and so on, and yes. just broad, popularize that for a broad audience so that we can all learn the science-based ways of finding meaning and purpose in life. That is quite an unusual um, subject because I would not have put science and the meaning of life together in, in one sentence. So how does that work? Sure. So, yeah, most people don't, you know. We typically think of getting meaning in life associated with things like religion or things like cultural traditions and not yeah. things like science. Now, yes. yeah, but there's been a lot of research recently on how do you get meaning and purpose in life from science, from like scientific research. What, how do you actually do it? What does that mean? 
Yeah. And research shows that you can definitely use science-based strategies to find a deep sense of meaning and purpose in life and you don't need religion, you don't need cultural traditions to do so. It's just a matter of several things, several science-based strategies that are all you need to find a rich sense of meaning and purpose. I can talk about them if you wish. Please do, because I'm actually quite intrigued now because finding purpose, finding meaning, it seems because recently, well, well, last week, you know, we finished uh, a seven episode series, you know, on child abuse um, and the stages of grief. And, you know, sometimes people tend to use religion to help them to cope with grief or, you yeah. know, when something bad has happened. And, you know, people have a lot of different coping mechanisms. So it's, quite mind-boggling that you can actually put science and that in the same in the same sentence so i'm actually <laughs> quite intrigued yes. now sure well happy you're intrigued so yeah let's talk about the science of it so how the yes. science works is that folks are evaluated on what gives them meaning and purpose and there are several things that do so as a result of studies okay. so first of all you, you might want to know that meaning and purpose is not kind of a simple, fuzzy term. Yeah. Uh, what the, the question is, how do scholars use it? So meaning mm. and purpose refers to the broad, overarching drive that motivates all of your actions in life. You know, why do you wake up in the morning? Yeah. Why do you go and do what you do? Why are you interested in, like, why, why aren't you, like, snuggling under your blanket and, you know, just having Earl Grey tea all day? <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Yes, exactly. So that's what meaning and purpose refers to, that overarching drive. Now, yeah. research shows that people who have a strong sense of meaning and purpose actually have much better physical and mental health than those who don't. Yeah. So things like uh, people get less heart attacks, less strokes, less uh, intestinal diseases, a bunch of other things. People have mm -hmm. less depression, less anxiety, less risky behaviors, yeah. have greater longevity. So meaning and purpose is a really important thing to have for people who don't have it. So yes. it, that's really very important. And what the research shows, so that's the, the importance of it. What the research shows on how to get it, there are four broad science-based strategies that you can use to get meaning and purpose. One is having a sense of your long-term goals. That's vital because that, that connects to the overarching drive. You know, why do you wake up in the morning? So having a sense of your long-term goals, what you're seeking to pursue, so figuring that out. That's one out of four. Okay. The second one is self-reflection. So reflecting on the connection between your long-term goals and your everyday activity. And so what gives you meaning and purpose in the everyday life. So that's the second of four. Yeah. Then the third is having a community, having community and social bonds. So that correlates clearly with a strong sense of meaning and purpose. So that's the third out of four. And the yeah. last one is serving something bigger than yourselves. So charitable work, serving others, various philanthropic activities, volunteer activities, and so on. So those are the four things that research yeah. shows are necessary to develop a strong sense of meaning and purpose. Yeah. But I'm kind of ask what you do, but then see, because what you're saying though, um, it also has a religious or a spiritual connotation, especially the last one, you know, sort of trying to do something that's, uh, how did you say it? That's above yourself or yeah, beyond serving, yourself? Serving something outside of yourself, serving yeah. others in some way. Yeah, so a lot of people would say that that has a lot of religious connotations to it or a spiritual um, connotation to it. So how is that then linked to science? Sure, that's uh, not, there's no necessary tie to religion at all. So research shows that humans are social animals. Yeah. So humans need connections to something other than ourselves, outside ourselves, to feel complete, whole, fulfilled, flourish and have that sense of meaning and purpose. Yes. So one, so strategy three is having those social bonds. So having good friends, good community and so on. Strategy yes. four is serving others. So yes. altruistic activities, volunteering and so on. That's not at all necessarily associated with religion 
uh, or spirituality. People who are secular do various sorts of philanthropic activities all the time. Yeah. And they serve yeah. things other than themselves because they want to create a better world. Yes. So that's not a spiritual thing. That's just an altruistic thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, now, fair enough. So uh, why, now uh, a question I often get asked is why is religion often associated with meaning and purpose? And the reason it yeah. is associated with meaning and purpose is because religious contexts often happen to provide those four things. The you know, ah. long-term goals, kind of religion with God and so on, self-reflection and religious community. Uh, so self-reflection gets into that, uh, serving God, uh, serving, uh, that's the fourth one, and then community, so church, community. Yeah. Now, there is no, those things aren't necessary at all. So in contexts where there isn't religion, mm. people have a strong sense of meaning and purpose all the time through doing those four things. I mentioned, yes. I mentioned they spent time in Russia. So yes. a specific thing I researched was the Soviet Union and yes. how people got a sense of meaning and purpose in there. And they got okay. it through various community institutions, club-like institutions, where yeah. people got together, they did philanthropic activities, volunteer activities, they had community, self-reflection, they had long-term goals, without in any way having a religious connotation. So that's something that people do very much. And I serve, a, I actually just did some consulting for a bunch of UK agencies, uh, non-profit agencies, as okay. part of the Good Lab initiative. And these are kind of very big, prominent, well-known agencies, non-profits. And basically, they're trying to create a way to help people in the UK have a fulfilled sense of meaning and purpose and creating yes. social institutions around that especially for elderly people to combat yeah. the sense of loneliness that people feel and the lack of meaningfulness and fulfillment that many people don't go to church they don't have that church activity so they want to create a secular alternative that would yeah. still provide people with that sense of meaning and purpose yeah sounds interesting yeah um, okay. Um, okay so what's the plan then with this with this organization what how are you guys going to do it? So, uh, yes. So, what they're, what we're, what we're consulting on, and the organization is called the Good Lab for anyone who's interested. Okay. So we are thinking about various proposals right now that nonprofits came up with, and how to institute them. So, uh, one idea that I especially like is to create clubs for elderly people who would be able to get together and have various services provided to them in clubs that would help them develop that sense of meaning and purpose. So those four things that I talked about. Yes. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so moving on now. So we've sort of gotten an idea of, you know, the um, the background to it. So how, what are the um, specific science strategies? Sure. So with finding uh, long-term goals, let's talk about that first. So there okay. are a variety of things that you would want to associate with, that you would want to figure out how, what you aspire to do. So think about various verbs that resonate with you. Things like feeling happy or feeling fulfilled. Hello? Yeah, Hello? I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so feeling fulfilled, feeling happy, uh, feeling a sense of beauty feeling uh, a sense of flourishing. So verbs that speak and resonate to you, feeling useful, impactful. Yes. What are the things that you want in your life? How do you hmm. want to live your life? What do you want to associate with that? So for the, you know, the book, Find Your Purpose Using Science that I wrote, which is available at intentionalinsights.org, on Amazon and elsewhere, has a whole list, a long list of these verbs and adjectives that people typically associate with how they want their life experience to be. Then it asks yeah. them to define each of these terms for themselves. So they pick, pick two or three, let's say people pick something like happy or something like fulfilled or something like 
useful and then define yeah. what that means for you in a sentence or two so then okay. once you def once you define each of those things in a sentence i can give an example of myself yeah so i want to be happy fulfilled and flourishing so okay. happy for me in a sentence meaning feeling a sense of satisfaction and contentment throughout yes. my life so that's yeah. happiness i feel like oh, yeah. fulfillment is a sense that i am fulfilling and achieving all of my values and yeah. the sense of flourishing for me is a sense of well-being in all of my life areas which is my self-life area my life partnership with my wife and life partner then a feeling of fulfillment in feeling of flourishing in my social circle then happy with my friends and community then professional life and then civic activities yeah so that's, that for me is my long-term aspiration that's how mm. i want to live my life yeah and so folks would go through that and decide they would go through the book and they would figure out for themselves what are their long-term aspirations what speaks to them yeah and that's that's crucial because the sense of meaning and purpose has to come from within has to come from oneself and no one can tell you what your sense of meaning and purpose is it's something you have to figure out so that's the first step of it okay. and then this the second step is reflecting on your sense of meaning and purpose and so there's an, an app that a web app that i created uh, with collaboration with some people called find your purpose and it's at findyourpurpose.online and all of this information is available at intentionalinsights.org so okay. find your purpose online people evaluate their current sense of being and purpose and how it ties to their long-term goals yeah and then they do some journaling some writing about how their long-term aspirations tie to their everyday activities you know kind of you wake up every day and uh, you know you go and do this radio show which i'm glad to be on and how does that tie to your sense of meaning and purpose you know what is the salience of that for you how do you do that and you know obviously do it with your lovely child and you know <laughs> what's the sense of meaning and purpose for that you know <laughs> yeah so, and, and so on how does that tie to your sense of meaning and, purpose? and then uh, so th that's journaling is a very important research-based strategy that helps people figure out their sense yeah. of meaning and purpose in life yeah so after folks journal they can also do some mindfulness meditation on it that depends on whether people practice meditation or not. Meditation is a good science-based strategy for self-exploration and getting focused, getting calm, getting content. So, you know, before, for example, before I did this uh, show, I did some meditation to calm myself, get down, get centered, get focused. And that's uh, described in the book. So the specific steps that you would do to figure out your meaning and purpose and tie that to your meditative activities. So that's right, a self reflection. Hmm? Yeah, sorry, quick question though. Again, as and many as you want. Sort of... What did you say? As many questions as you want. Ah, right, okay. So maybe it's just, you know, I guess my own interpretation um, of things. Uh, because when I think of meditation, I think um, not necessarily religion. Well, I think sort of a spiritual type because I think I think of the ancient monks in, in China or you know and Buddhism and they tend to do a lot of meditation you know as part yep. of their everyday life so now saying that meditation is a science-based strategy it's just not equated in my head oh fair enough so uh, you know how scientists have examined acupuncture and they yeah. found that acupuncture is actually quite effective in addressing pain and various illnesses in the body so yes not as much as the acupuncture practitioners claim but there are plenty yeah. of science-based aspects of acupuncture so in the same way meditation doesn't have all the benefits that spiritual practitioners of it claim but science yeah. has evaluated various aspects of meditation and has found that yes meditation is definitely impactful and it's quite useful for various areas of life you know science and spirituality are not at all opposed yes you know, the nature of spirituality just like religion and science aren't opposed 
you just within within religion you look at you know things that have been demonstrated by science for work so for example community belonging is not something you would think of intuitively as scientific yeah. but then science went and researched okay community belonging and they found that community belonging is really important for our mental and physical health yeah so therefore that contribute that's a science-based strategy you want to have community around you in order to have mm -hmm. good mental and physical health in the same way meditation has been researched by scientists and it has been shown to contribute to various aspects of mental and physical health and mm -hmm. uh, my book describes the specific aspects of meditation that contribute to a strong sense of meaning and purpose but yes. there are other books um, that people can pick up just generally on meditation and the specific science-based meditation. So a uh, well-known one is by this author named John Kabat-Zinn, who is a scientist. Mm -hmm. He uh, examines meditation, he did a lot of studies on it, and he wrote books such as Full Catastrophe Living. So for your listeners who want to check out, so that's Full mm -hmm. Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn. And it describes various science-based aspects of meditation. So what you can trust meditation to do well for you. Things like yeah. trust pain, uh, decreased mental and physical suffering, improve focus and concentration, improve discipline, self-control, and so on. So meditation yeah. is definitely useful from a science-based perspective. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, how do you spell um, John's last name? Uh, it's K A B O T dash Z I N N. John Kabazin. Ah, right. Okay, Kabazin. Okay, perfect. Right. It's just because right. actually, I was thinking to myself, if I wanted to spell it, how am I going to spell it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you for asking that question. Yes. So, okay. Full Catastrophe Living is a really good book. Another one is. Uh, wherever you go, there you are. But I'd recommend Full Catastrophe Living as a starting point. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Yes. So, okay. And what uh, what are the um, strategies um, are yes. there? Uh, let, let's uh, let's go to the other two strategies. So, community okay. and social bonds. Yes. So, community and social bonds. There are several things to consider within those strategies. So first of all, looking at your current community and social bonds, you obviously have a lovely bond with your child who is uh, going to bring you some Earl Grey tea. So that's kind of a you know, bond. Your family bonds, how are those doing? Your friendships, how are you feeling? How are you, uh, what is your feeling about your friendship bonds? Are they bringing you meaning and purpose? Is, mm. Are your family bonds bringing you meaning and purpose? Yes. And consider that and see whether you can do something. If you're not satisfied with them, then see if you can do something to enrich them and make them stronger to give you a richer sense of meaning and purpose. Then consider your community. What kind of communities are you engaged in? Are you satisfied with your community engagement? Is it fulfilling for you? Does it bring you that sense of meaning and purpose? And again, tie that to the long-term aspirations that you wrote out earlier in your first strategies. You know, if you want to be useful, for example, how do your community bonds help you be useful? Or how do they help you be fulfilled? And so on. Yes. So tie all of that to the long-term aspirations. So yeah. That's the kind of community bonds that you would want to think about. And then the yes. last one is serving others. So there you can think about philanthropic activities in volunteering and in donations. So what kind of volunteering do you do? How well is that tied to your long-term aspirations that you wrote out in the first part? So tying yeah. all of those in is very important. What about your uh, donations? How are you doing in your donations? Are you serving your the causes, the world that you want to live in through your donations? Are you helping make that happen? There is a specific um, type of donations that's especially impactful, and that's called effective altruism. So it uh, references evaluating how impactful your donations actually are. Are you giving yeah. to the causes that are going to most 
impactfully address the problems. And the way to, and I, we talk about that, I talk about that in the book, and find your purpose using science, and more broadly, in the organization I run, Intentional Insights, so intentionalinsights.org, which focuses yeah. on helping people to make wise decisions in all areas of their life, including their philanthropy. So, okay. are you actually looking at the charities and comparing them on how effective each charity is? Are you comparing them on the impact that they're making on the world? Are you looking at their cost effectiveness? So, how much good are they doing per pound? So, mm -hmm. are you actually thinking about that? Or kind of, are you just giving because the, the charity happened to reach out to you and, you know, then you're like, okay, sure, I'll give it to you. Because if you do that, then the consequence is that the charities which have the best marketing will win yes. out, as opposed to charities yeah. that do the most good for the world. So charities yeah. have poor incentives to spend their money on marketing as opposed to doing good. So yes. therefore, as a savvy philanthropist, as a savvy donor, you have the responsibility of making sure that your donations do the most good for the world. And that gives you a greater sense of meaning and purpose, knowing that you're doing the most good for the world. Yes. So again, that all ties in to that sense of meaning and purpose and how you can get that. So these are kind of the four strategies and they're all outlined thoroughly in my book and described how to get there. There are various exercises that help yes. people address these things. Again, find your purpose using science. Well done. See, now it's actually definitely got me thinking because, you know, like you said, you know, meditation, I, I, I just keep going back to it because it's just not something that I would have automatically think of as a science-based strategy. And so I was actually quite intrigued to to hear about to hear about it. But no, that's 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 quite good. But then again, I guess in the whole, it's just sort of about making someone take a moment and step back and smell the roses. Because you know, the world today, you know, we're really what's the way I'm gonna describe it? We're so busy with mundane things that we don't really have yeah. the time for the things that are, are that are quite important to us anymore. Yes. That's it's very true. So taking some time to uh, for self-reflection and self-exploration is very important. The only things we control in life, the only things, are our mm. thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Those are the only things we control in life, and so few people realize that. We can't control the environment mm. outside of ourselves. You know, you can't con yeah. you can't control your child, no matter how you try, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yes, we can't control our, you know, um, whether the connection will hold up on the on the interview that we're having right now. We can't control anything yes. outside of ourselves. But the only thing we can control is how we react, how we respond to those external stimuli. So our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And that's yes. the whole essence of the organization I run, Intentional Insights or Intentional Insights at work. How do you control and manage the only things you can control in life so that you can evaluate reality accurately and make wise decisions to reach your goals? And meditation very much helps with that because it helps you be in a state of control. It helps you manage yourself. It helps you control yourself and helps you reflect on your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors as they tie to your sense of meaning and purpose and your long-term aspirations and your everyday life in the moment. How do you actually live your life? And how do you manage your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and re your responses to external stimuli? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, quite, that's, quite, that's quite interesting. Hmm. Hmm. How, so what, what stimulated your interest in science-based strategies? What got you interested in that? Sure. So what got me interested in that is that I saw people around me making, well, uh, making decisions. I, well, let me tell you my backstory. So when I was a kid, okay. I was always interested in how people made their decisions, why they did what they did, how they functioned, yeah. how groups made decisions, how people felt, you know, why. Mm. The question oh. of why was always the most fascinating mm. for me. And I also wanted, at the same time, I also wanted to help people have a good life. So that was also yes. always an interest for me, 
always fascinating for me, how to help people have a good life. So combining these things, helping people have a good life, and the question of why, I went into academia. And that's when I uh, developed my fascination with science-based strategies because I saw that, you know, in these very com you know these very complex academic books, you had very you had really fascinating things that weren't available for a broad audience, and it was really surprising for me that you had really these really very important strategies for how to live and this, you yeah. know, using research, using science, so something we can really trust. Yes. And I was looking for things that we can really trust, that we, I can yeah. know the truth, and why yes. people made these decisions, how people felt, why their emotions were they were, they were why they behaved yes. the way they did, and that's what I was looking for. And the people studied these things, they did research on these things, they did research on many people, and studied how people felt, how people thought, how they behaved. So I can yes. know I can trust that, and that's the only thing you can trust. Research, studies, seeing why people did the way they did what they did. So yes. using the, these studies and using this research, I was able to understand myself much better, and I was able to understand people around me much better. But you know what? Uh, I saw that people around me were making really poor decisions, were making really, and had really bad outcomes. They had much worse mental and physical health. They were suffering. There was so much suffering. There's so much suffering in the world. And, you know, if people knew the science-based strategies behind how to address their suffering, their anguish, then they could know in the most effective way possible how to deal with their suffering, how to address their suffering, how to not have that poor mental health, poor physical health, you know, heart attacks, diseases, strokes, anxiety, mm. depression, and just yes. so much stress in people's lives. And they just make very poor decisions every day. And I just wanted to help people address that. And that is why I went into this field. This is why I decided to switch my focus from writing for other academics uh, and help and to instead being a science popularizer and writing that book for a broad audience and running the nonprofit Intentional Insights at intentionalinsights.org yes. and I'm writing other books as well to just help get these ideas out there because to address the suffering that I see in the world and just help make the world a better place because you know if I don't do it I don't see other people doing it and I'm you know this is where I just feel that I can make the most difference in the world to help the world be a better place. Yeah, that's that's actually quite that's quite good. So, if you were to tell um, a fellow author, I've you know written this book on science-based strategies, right? And an yep. author wants to then start, you know, saying, you know, what, I'm thinking of writing a book. How can this author then apply, you know, the science-based strategies to writing his own or her own book? Excellent question. So first, the author should uh, see to what extent or how writing the book ties to the author's, ties to her or his long-term aspirations. Mm -hmm. To how that will address the author's sense of meaning and purpose. We all do things because we have needs and yes. wants. We, yes. all, we all have needs and wants. And if we don't know our own needs and wants, we won't really be successful in addressing our needs and wants, right? Yes. <laughs> and figuring out our sense of meaning and purpose is fundamental to addressing those needs and wants. And if what is our broad, what are our broad aspirations in life? Yes. Then, once we understand our broad aspirations in life, we can see how writing the book that we want to write addresses those aspirations in life mm. and that's going to be fundamental because the most important thing i think to writing and you know you interviewed many authors on the show you can reflect on this is drive yes. is motivation is desire yes. because yes. it's so easy to think that we want to write a book and kind of fancy oh i want to be a book author but to yes. not have the but what we really need fundamentally is the aspiration not 
the desire to be a book author, but the, the real desire and motivation to write the book and yes. be very passionate about it because there's so many things that authors will not anticipate that will go wrong in writing the book that there are so yes. many things they will need to learn, so many things that they will need to discover, and we can go into them. But the thing that they will need to overcome these things is a strong passion and desire to write the book. And if yes. they don't know why they're doing it, how it ties to their needs and motivations, how it ties to their broad aspirations, yes. they won't succeed. They just won't succeed. So just they shouldn't mm -hmm. bother. I mean, if they don't have that long-term aspiration to do the book. So that's what I would say yeah. is the most fundamental thing. What do yes. you think? No, it's perfect, you know, because a lot of people, you have to have passion. Um, if you're not passionate about it, you know, definitely do not go into it. It's kind of like, you know, podcasting, you know, sometimes some people think, oh, yes, I want to podcast and whatnot, but it takes, it takes a lot of passion for you to, you know, to, to begin it. It's kind of like the honeymoon period. It sounds fascinating, yeah. it sounds good, but then when, yeah. when the honeymoon period is over, it's literally your passion that's going to, that's going to keep you, keep you going. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. This is fundamental to realize that it's only your passion, only your interest, and you need to be very committed in order, so you shouldn't start if you're not already passionate about it, if you haven't explored it, and if you don't know why you're doing it, if you don't tie it to your long-term needs, aspirations, and goals. And there are many, you know, you see a lot of celebrities who've written books, prominent, famous authors, but you don't see all the failed authors, all the people who's, who didn't finish writing their books or yes. who sold on like, you know, 50 copies of their book. You don't want to be in that position. You want to be very committed. And if you're committed, if you're willing to put in the work, you're going to uh, succeed. But you have to be very, very willing to put in a lot of work into podcasting, into book writing, you know, the passion, the passion and the enthusiasm has to be there. So yes. after you got the passion and the enthusiasm down, you have to figure out your plan. So yes. you have to make a plan, you have to do a lot of research that, first of all, to figure out if there is a market for the book. You know, if yes. there will be people willing to buy the book. You know, before I wrote Find Your Purposes in Science, you know, I knew I wanted to popularize this stuff, but is a book going to be the best way of popularizing these ideas? I researched the market, I saw, I investigated whether there would be a desire for uh, the book. I wrote a number of articles, appeared in a number of podcasts and radio interviews, and I saw that there would be a market for the book before I wrote it. And so then once I saw there was a market for the book, that's when I started planning out the book. So seeing if there's a market, seeing if there's an audience is really important. Well, what's your experience with this and with what authors do to help themselves figure out whether there's a market? Um, well, you see, that's the thing. A lot of time, right, that from just, you know, being part of groups, what I see is that a lot of authors, especially first-time authors, they seem to think that the hardest gift is just to be published or put in, you know, submit, right? Especially those, you know, who self-publish, right? And then when yeah. they... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? When they, you know, publish, let's say they use Amazon, for instance, you know, they've gone through the whole KDP, um, you know, publishing, and they can't hit submit, they sort of think that just by virtue of the fact that they can't submit, they're going to just start getting book sales. But then when <laughs> they, they look through their dashboard, zero, zero, yep. zero, zero. Or then maybe they might have one list from a family member or a friend, and then yep. zero, zero. Then they kind of, then it starts to dawn on them that actually, wait, just submitting and publishing my book is not enough. You know, and so then they now start coming to forums going, oh, what have I done wrong? You know, why is this? So a lot of times they don't realize that writing a book is actually the easiest thing anybody can do. It's yeah. the marketing that's yep. the hard bit. Yep, yep, yeah, absolutely. So uh, people who are experienced will know that the first thing they need to do in marketing is explore whether there's a market. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, will anyone... Uh, accept their family members by the book and then of course once if they think that there's a market they actually need to do the marketing the marketing is the hard part the hard yeah. bit you, know, you need to be out there and promoting the book 
unless yeah. you have a lot of money and you have, want to hire a marketing agency to do it for you, which is also possible. Yes. But, you know, you have to be rich for that. And yes. I'm not rich. I don't, most self-published authors aren't rich. So, no. you know, I published Find Your Purpose Using Science, you know, myself, and, you know, that's, you know, I have to do a lot of marketing for it. So that's definitely very important. Plan out your marketing. So then we get to the next stage of making the plan. So you want to mm -hmm. plan out the marketing in advance. You want to plan out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Who yes. are your contacts? in the marketing yes. industry what kind of blogs can you get yourself on what kind of podcasts can you get yourself on how will yes. you uh, write press releases for the book you know what kind of are you going to invest time or money or both into marketing the book how and what are the specific steps so that when you write the book mm -hmm. you will keep those things in mind as you're doing your writing and once a, a strategic thing to do is to release parts of the book as single chapter articles like spin it out into blog articles into newspaper articles or so on yes. help yourself get already some uh, recognition name recognition and desire yes. for fans from yes. fans yes and, so you yeah. think that so I was say, the thing that I've discovered is that when you're a new author, people take a chance on you as a person rather than a chance on your book. Because you can imagine there are thousands and thousands and thousands of books in any genre, you know. So even if you wanted to say, oh, well, is there a market? Yes, let's go and write romance, right? Well, why should someone read your book over someone else's, you know, romance book? You know, there are thousands yeah. and thousands of, you know. So again, most of the time it's about connecting with people because people take a chance on you, the author, and not necessarily just your book. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a very wise insight. I think it's uh, a lot of people have difficulty recognizing that when people take a chance on buying the book, uh, even if they have, even if you offer the book for free, they have to invest resources of time into reading it. And yes. they have to decide whether it's a worthwhile product before they read the book. And they're not yes. just going to trust you if they don't know you. So you want to build up yes. your author platform before yes. you publish. And author platform for first-time authors or things or think people who are thinking about it is a term within the profession uh, of authoring, uh, of writing, <laughs> that refers to your fan base. Yes. And how do you do outreach to your fan base? So these, this involves things like creating your website. So folks who want to check out my website can go to globetsapurski.com and they can see my website there. And that's yeah. the website that I use to promote my brand, my personality. That's not, brand is another jargony term that we in the profession use to refer to mm -hmm. once how people, what people associate with you when they think of your name. So folks mm -hmm. listening to this show can search, you know, for Gleb Tsipursky, and that's G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y on Google or Bing, Bing or whatever you use and see what comes up when they do their hits. You know, is it my old high school photo? That's not yeah. what I want to come up. You know, that's not the thing that I want to come up with. I, what I want to come up is my website and links about the recent articles that I published, you know, things like, you know, I publish in venues like Time, Psychology Today, Huffington Post, Salon. I go on network TV, I go on podcasts like this one here and various radio networks, that's what I want to come up. And that's what yeah. uh, other authors want to come up. They want their name to be recognized and known and positively thought about because yes. readers will Google you before they buy the book, most likely. And they will yes. want to see credibility, what's called social proof. And social proof yes. is another term that refers to other people having yes. approval of your book. So approving yes. your book, having good reviews, and so on. So you want to build your fan base strategically. You want to build up your brand strategically before you publish that book so that people yes. will want to download and buy it if you publish it online or print it. If you yeah. do it, you know, self-printing, then they will want to buy a hard copy. They have to invest yeah. money and time into that. You want to get them prepared for it before you publish. Yes. 
No, definitely, definitely. But anywho, it's coming to the end of the day. You know, I'm in London. It gets gloomy. The sun's out. Well, the sun's out. The sun's disappeared. Um, it's just one of those times where you just think, oh, my God, I really need to sit down. Somebody should get me something, right? I think so. what would make me really, really happy right now is if someone got me a massive mug, right? It's kind of like a tank. <laughs> you know those ones where you can have, like, you can have like two big mugs of hot chocolate in one, and then you don't feel guilty that you've gone to make two hot chocolates, right? Because you can just have yes. it one massive one in one mug, and then you say, I'm having one hot chocolate, even though in reality, yes. it's two. See, now, yes, if someone got me that kind of mug, really I would be very happy. That would make me very happy. It's really funny. It reminds me of uh, a study I saw. Uh, so one of my research studies that people, when they have like an... Uh, there were some researchers who created like an endless bowl of soup for people to eat. <laughs> like they pumped up, there was a pump that pumped up soup into the soup bowl so it didn't diminish when they were eating it and people ate a whole of a lot more soup than the regular bowl of soup that they would eat. <laughs> so maybe what you want is an endless mug of hot chocolate. It's like a small mug that keeps magically refilling itself and you're like, Oh, I'm just having one mug. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That would do me fine just as well. That would do me fine. <laughs> but yeah, so if anyone wants to get me a Christmas present or a New Year's present or even an advance, even though you don't love me, I would like to think you love me for the get me an advance Valentine's present. Please, that's the only thing that I want. Get me a nice big one and it's just one, one drink. Oh, the little human is so happy that I've said other people should love me. Okay, fine, darling. They don't love me so much. Only you love me. Come. Big hug. <laughs> My little human, she gets really jealous. It's like, <laughs> she gets really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's what I want. So yes, I'm going to have to kick you out now so that I can go and make two mugs, right? Sure. So since that I don't have the big one, I'm going to have to go and do this. Well, I do it one after the other because when you have one, it kind of like just gets rid of the initial thirst. But then you're like, okay, right, now I need something to just suit my throat. And so then, you know, you get the second mug because then that just, Absolutely. ah, right. Now I feel, you know, satisfied. Whereas with one, it's just not doing the job. That makes sense. Well, can I have my Earl Grey tea to go then? <laughs> I thought you were going to forget about it. <laughs> no. How can I forget about my Earl Grey tea? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go look for. Let me see now. Where is our nice tea? We've got a nice thermal. Um, you know, we've got those plasticky ones that's almost like foam. Right, so I'll, I'll get that for you in a second now. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Um, so well, if someone wanted so to contact you, um, I know you've said it before, but just remind us, because again, I can sure. say for everyone, I have been here really for the next 21 years. So how do people contact you if they want to get in touch? Sure. So my book is Find Your Purpose Using Science. My website, my personal website is glebtsipurski.com. The organization I run is Intentional Insights, and its website is intentionalinsights.org. And if people want to get a hold of me, you can always email me at gleb at intentionalinsights.org. And for viewer and for listeners of the show, I can send you a free early version of my book, art version of my book, if you email me at gleb at intentionalinsights.org and say you've heard me on this show. Yay, we like freebies. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> right, but again, well, so your, your tea, I will put it in the in your inbox. In the meantime, well, I wish you a happy holiday, and, you know, and hopefully we will see you again soon. I don't like it when yep. you come back on the show. Yeah, this was lovely. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, see yep. you next time. Bye see now. See you next time. Bye-bye.